Let's go over lung volumes now. I know you've seen this curve before. I just want to make this a intuitive and automatic response to uh, talk about any of these particular lung volumes. Your normal relaxed breathing pattern, you're breathing in and out is your tidal volume. If you go from the top of your natural breathing and take an even deeper breath, as deep as you can, that volume in addition is called the inspiratory reserve volume. If instead you go from the natural end point of your tidal volume, that's here, and blow out as much air as you possibly can, this is the expiratory reserve volume. So your inspiratory reserve is what's available on top of your tidal volume, and your expiratory reserve is what's available below your tidal volume. The last volume is the residual volume, which is whatever is left in your lungs after you've expired all the air. So this is the air that you cannot get rid of, and it is a residual volume. You also have capacities, which are just the sum of one or more volumes. Your total lung capacity is just all of the volumes added together, so it is all of the air that is in your lungs. Your vital capacity is just all of the air in your lungs that you have to work with, so your total lung capacity minus your residual volume. Your inspiratory capacity is your tidal volume and your inspiratory reserve volume. And last but not least, probably what we talk about most in anesthesia is this capacity from the bottom of your tidal volume, including your residual volume, and this is the FRC, or functional residual capacity. I should star this. That's functional residual capacity. Actually, let me move this star to just the bottom of the tidal volume, because there's something very special about this, which is that it is the natural resting position of your lung. So this is where the um, collapsing elastic recoil forces of your lungs balance out with the nature of your chest wall to want to expand, and that is where it leaves your chest wall resting. So that's the end point of your um, expiration of your tidal volume. Let's call that the end point of tidal volume is where uh, chest wall expansion and lung recoil balance. So we'll call that the natural resting position. So you can see that the FRC is the capacity um, or the volume of uh, air left in the lung at your resting point. So under anesthesia, uh, when you're anesthetized and apneic, this is the FRC is the volume of air that remains in your lungs, since this is the natural resting position of the lungs when you're relaxed. So that's very important for essentially two reasons. First being that the oxygen in your FRC will determine the amount of time that you can be apneic before you start to desat. Because whatever's left in the FRC before a patient stops breathing is all they're going to have. Unless, of course, you give them a breath. The other interesting thing we can talk about with the FRC is, as we mentioned earlier, there's alveolar collapse that happens at a certain low volume. Um, so that is going to depend on the FRC versus the closing capacity. Essentially, if the resting volume of your lungs is on the low side, then you might actually have small airway collapse that's starting to happen. As you can imagine, there are a number of things that will affect the resting volume of your lungs, which, by the way, is about 30 mils per kilo of body weight. This would be ideal body weight, which works out to about 2 liters um, for a normal 70 kilogram person adult. In someone with a restrictive lung disease, the volumes will be smaller and therefore your FRC 
is going to be decreased. Uh, whereas if you have someone with an obstructive lung disease, you might actually have increased FRC. These people have difficulty expiring air, so over time their resting lung volume will actually increase. Intra-abdominal pressure will push in and up on your diaphragm. Um, so, for example, if you are pregnant, there is often a decrease in about 20% of the FRC by term because of all the additional space and pressure that's pushing up on the diaphragm. And then obesity will do the same thing. Positioning will have a large impact on your FRC. So somewhere in the range of 30% reduction from going from upright to supine. And that should make sense too, because when this patient is upright, the weight of their um, abdomen does not compress their diaphragm, whereas in the supine position, so as they lay down, then this will really start to press up on the diaphragm and decrease their resting volumes. When you lose the resting tone of your diaphragm, essentially something similar will happen. The resting tone of the diaphragm essentially achieves the same thing, um, but if you take that away, then your diaphragm may migrate a little bit up and you'll have decreased volumes. And being female uh, decreases your FRC about 10% compared to males of the same size. As you get older, your FRC decreases and it increases with height. I guess the other thing I should say about age is that in the neonatal population, you have a significantly decreased FRC as well. So basically, we know that having a decent FRC is good because we want a decent reserve of oxygen in our lungs and we want uh, to prevent alveolar collapse. And we have all these factors working against us during the induction of anesthesia, like losing our diaphragm tone, changing our position, um, the intra-abdominal pressure situation. So some strategies to minimize the decrease in FRC would be to tilt the bed up. So reverse Trendelenburg position. This will decrease the effect of positioning on our FRC. We can use CPAP while pre-oxygenating a patient, which can help keep some of the small airways open. Um, or we could do a rapid sequence induction, which sometimes is the most reasonable option because we avoid the issue of waiting for good intubating conditions while we burn through our oxygen reserve in the FRC, which is sometimes the most reasonable option. Um, let's use an example of a morbidly obese patient um, who otherwise has reassuring airway features. They will have decreased FRC because of the additional mass pushing down on their um, diaphragm when they're in the supine position. This same thing happening will greatly decrease their chest wall compliance, so you're gonna need very high pressures when you're bag mask ventilating them. So maybe instead of 15 centimeters of water, you're needing to use 30, and half of that air is going into the stomach instead because you're opening your lower esophageal sphincter at those pressures. All of these things together make it seem really not so ideal to be doing your regular induction for this patient. And instead, we can avoid all these issues by just rapidly securing the airway. Your oxygen consumption relates to how much time you have before you desat given a certain amount of oxygen in your FRC. So typically there's about 200 to 300 mils per minute of O2 consumed at rest for an average sized adult. The reason we pre-oxygenate patients is to fill up the FRC with essentially 100% oxygen rather than 21% which they'd be breathing at room air. You could also call this denitrogenation. We're essentially washing the nitrogen out and replacing it with oxygen. So that maximizes the O2 available to you during your apneic period. Let's suppose this patient has an FRC of about 2,000 mils. 
which is reasonable. If we manage to replace all 2,000 mils here with 100% oxygen, we'd have 2,000 mils of oxygen divided by 250 mils per minute, which is being consumed, and that would give us eight minutes of apnea to burn through all this oxygen that we have in the FRC. So that's with 100% O2. Realistically, it's gonna be challenging to get quite to 100% because you may be entraining a little bit of air in through the side if you don't have a perfect seal here. As a good rule of thumb, if you target an end tidal O2 of 80%, that's a very reasonable amount of pre-oxygenation for you to proceed with induction. Compare that though with the patient who you have not pre-oxygenated at all. So your actual volume of oxygen in the lungs is closer to 400 rather than 2000 mils divided by 250 mils per minute consumed by the patient will give us only 1.68 minutes of apnea to burn through all of this oxygen in the lungs. So you can see what a huge difference it makes to have adequate pre-oxygenation versus just proceeding with the patient breathing room air. Another reminder to check your flows of oxygen while you're pre-oxygenating the patient to make sure that you are indeed delivering them 100% oxygen. Um, otherwise, they may just be breathing room air and you may be surprised at how quickly they desaturate while you're trying to secure their airway.